Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming uh, and voting for my talk. Um, I really hope you like math, because half these slides are math. But I mean, I'll walk through the math. It's not that complicated if you just abstract it. Um, anyway, so the scheme is the talk is about anonymous credentials um, through modern cryptography. So uh, the agenda for today, motivation, uh, why, why we want anonymous credentials, and why we, we want these kind of primitives. Uh, a bit of a crypto crash course about, because this stuff is based on elliptic curves. So little security uh, crash course on elliptic curves. Then a little bit more into depth on uh, ring signature cryptography. Um, how that's actually constructed, I've, I've taken, uh, like I've actually implemented this stuff, but either way, I've, I've taken a paper and I've put, turned it into pseudocode, I'll walk through the pseudocode. You don't have to understand the math, but I'll, I'll share these slides after. And my slides are usually really information dense, so um, you can read them after, it's not like a bunch of pictures, you're like, oh, what does it, I, can't, I can't remember what this guy said. Um, then we'll walk through the, the credentials scheme, um, add, you know, using the ring signatures for credentials. Um, and then after that, uh, extensions of I2P for like the real implementation. Um, you know, I2P being an invisible internet project, it's like Tor, but darknet only. Cool. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm lead engineer at a company called Clearmatics, and I work on distributed systems and, and cryptography. So like blockchains, but you know, like more, more than just blockchains. Uh, mostly a software engineer by trade, but with heavy personal interest in mathematics, uh, cryptography, and security. I'm heavily involved in the cryptocurrency and peer-to-peer -peer community. Uh, I'm passionate about giving non-crypto devs the knowledge needed to use modern crypto. Use it, not implement your own. It's very different. Uh, you, can see, you, know, you can take the libraries and, and use them to make your own schemes as long as you understand what the primitives give you. Don't try to roll. Never try, you know, don't roll your own scheme. I, even I wouldn't do that. Um, I take schemes from academic papers and I implement them. Um, I, only implement, I only come up with schemes that I really understand. Also, cryptography is my life. It's really great. Uh, you know, you can see from my T-shirt. Um, uh, like, you know, I'm really passionate about cryptography because it's the only field where you, the defender, have, can outmatch any attacker if you use if you use this crypto system properly. No other field can I take a calculator and you know if I know how to do the math, just you know derive a public key and sign something, and it takes an attacker you know hundreds hundreds of billions of dollars to even try to break my key. Um, it's the only one where the attacker defender. Um, uh, like ratio is, is just ridiculous. It's not even worth it for you get the attacker to try to break your crypto system if you actually use it properly. So again, so we'll start with the motivation for this talk. So why would we want anonymous credentials? Uh, and by, by anonymous credentials, I mean not like anonymous, anonymous password username. I mean, uh, like I give you something and then you can use that like a key and you can use that to authenticate yourself, but I don't know, all I know is you use the key you use a valid key, but I don't know which key you use or which credentials you use. So voting, for example, right? So you can give each key a key to each key holder, well, to each voter, eligible voter. So you know, you go to, you go to the embassy, like uh, Estonia does this. Uh, you you can get like a little cryptographic key, um, and then you're entitled to one and only one anonymous vote. They don't use it for voting, but you can. You, they're like the only country that has like EIDs right now. Uh, payments, you know, this is used in cryptocurrency, ring signatures, so you pay from a group instead of paying from an individual address. Um, so you like obfuscate or hide really sender recipient uh, links. Um, you know, leaking secrets, whistleblowing, this is, why, this is actually why uh, ring or group signatures were created uh, initially. Uh, I'll go that into a little bit later. Um, and also, you know, if you, if you uh, construct the scheme properly, if you're a little bit creative on how you use this, you can use, you know, truly anonymous, but rate limited resource access. So that's what this talks about. Um, and I'll, you know, I have, I have an implementation. I'm not sure if we get to the demo because there's a lot of slides and they're all very complicated, but we'll see. Either way, uh, I'll, I'll put the source code up on, on, uh, on GitHub. And I'm also doing a paper on, on um, privacy enhancing at the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium next year. Which like a, with a full like formal proof of all this stuff. So, so yeah, th this is the topic of the talk today. So let's go over this. So what are ring signatures exactly? So the concept is first introduced in a paper titled "How to Leak a Secret" by some of the, two of the RSA authors and some other guy. Um, so it concerns using keys in a group instead of using them individually to prove you have a private key from the group as opposed to proving ownership of a specific key. If I 
you know, like normal EC uh, DSA, elliptic curve signature, RSA signature. If I give you a signature, you have to know which public key that signature is associated, otherwise you can't, you know, you can't verify it because it's, it's like one-to-one -one correlation. But this um, allows you to have like a set of keys, like 10 keys, and I sign, uh, and given the ring of keys, you know, the, gr the group of those 10 keys in the signature, all you know is, ah, yes, you have one of the signatures, but I don't know which one. Um, and you know, nobody, like if, some, if you don't have a signature from this ring, you can't, you can't, you, like, you can't forge it. It's, uh, oh, anyway, I'll go into the math a little bit. Later, uh, so yeah, it's you know you 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 can it's very useful for whistleblowing, which is like what was the, which is how this concept was first introduced. It's if each public key in the group belongs to like a government official or like a journalist or somebody with a privileged access to information, the official can leak some classified data, proving that they are indeed a government official. So look, I have one of the ten keys that only belong to these ten politicians, but without in outing himself individually as the whistleblower. Um, yeah, so you know, some like, or you know, you work at a bank or, or in the government, or whatever. They're like doing some other crazy NSA stuff, and you really wanna, you're like really morally uh, opposed to this. And okay, you 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 can you can like attest, yes, look, it it's one of these people, and I, they do they would truly have data access to that, uh, but you have no idea which one it is. So cryptographically, you have no idea. It's just very secure. It's just, this is not like magic. This is not magic experimental crypto. This really only uses the same. Uh, security assumptions that uh, elliptic curves use. So if you trust elliptic curve signatures, it's not that, this is not much of a stretch. And, you know, so elliptic curves have been around for like 35 years now. Um, they're fine. So it's like, ooh, a little stylization of what a ring signature looks like, but I'll go through the math. So uh, ring signatures are a type of zero knowledge proof. So if you've never heard of zero knowledge proofs, what it means is uh, basically, I want to prove X and only X. I don't want to reveal anything other than um, that one bit of information. Um, you know, so you don't leak anything about the secret other than the fact that you have the secret. Um, so uh, people always use really crazy analogies, but I, I like this better. So a simple analogy here would be, I choose a card from a deck of cards, so you know, if your standard uh, 54 card deck, and I want to prove to you that it's a red card. Now, easily, obviously, if I just show you the card, I, well, that's, a, that's easy proof, but it's like showing you the private key. That's pretty stupid. Um, it, you know, it reveals more than just the color, like the suit and the number um, and whatever. And the position in the deck as well, if I do it in front of you. Um, but, you know, if on the other hand, I just take my card aside, you know, like, like take my right card, put it on a, on a pile here. I look at my, go through my uh, like 53 cards now, and I flip up uh, and I reveal to you all the black cards in the deck. Um, assuming that I follow the protocol correctly, like you know the, the deck has 20, uh, 20 uh, whatever, how many, 22 red cards and 22 black cards, however many cards are in the deck, uh, you know, like I've proved to you that the card I've set aside is a red card without proving anything else about the card, you know, without leaking anything else about the card. So the specific, there's many different types of zero knowledge proofs, um, but specifically the zero knowledge proof in ring signatures is called zero knowledge proof of set membership. Meaning that yes, I am. I prove to you that I am a member of the set. Me, like strictly, I am a member of the set of private key holders um, associated to these public keys. But I don't prove to you anything other than that. I just, it's just, I'm just proving to you that I am a set. You know, the signature just proves to you that I'm a set member. So uh, let's go through a really quick crash course, um, like, and I explain to you like the properties of elliptic curves um, from a very abstract level. Um, without going too deeply into how these operations go, but uh, the elliptic curves have a special property uh, that other crypto systems, or I guess, uh, you know, primitives used for signatures don't have. So mainly it's homomorphic and commutative operations. Um, what does that mean exactly? It means we can perform additions and multiplications on the public key without destroying its relation to the private key. So in mathematical terms, you can um, perform an amorphism which, uh, which uh, maintains the group structure, so it's an isomorphism. Um, not, that, and not, that, and not to say like, oh, look, I can just take the public key, add a bunch of random crap to it, and then you know, assume, don't, don't do anything else, and, and give you the uh, public key with a bunch of random crap added, and magically I still have the key to that. No, you, like, you have to perform the same operations on the private key, but this, isn't, this, isn't, this doesn't work on RSA, because RSA is, uh, like the security model is on like factoring primes and, and, and the modulus has to have like certain, uh, like the exponent is, is related to, is very specifically related to the modulus and the other parameters that you give in the signature. 
if you mess around with the public key, you have to find a totally new exponent. It's not, there's, not a, there's not an isomorphic map uh, in there. But with elliptic curves, there is. And so it allows all this cool stuff. So um, security crash course, uh, like what, what, you know, what, like what's the, what security do elliptic curves provide? You know, it's on RSA, it's pretty easy. Um, like, I guess most of you know, RSA is really just uh, based on the hardness of factoring composite, like, large numbers and finding uh, co-primes. So the security in elliptic curves is not based on that at all. It's, it's based on discrete logarithm problem. So, like, what's a logarithm if I have, you know, a to the power of x, and I have a result there, um, like, the logarithm of a, well, a, if a to the power of x equals y, the logarithm of y, given base a, would be x, right? So it's, it's reversing exponentiation. Um, so yeah, so yeah, given y equals gx, um, like y is the result of this operation, it's hard to recover y, uh, sorry, it's hard to recover x, which is the private key. So remembering both RSA and, and elliptic curves, we do it with integers on modular groups, meaning the operations wrap around, like, you know, with like clock arithmetic, what's, if for 24 hours, if, I, if I'm at 2 o'clock and I add 12 hours to that, I'm at 2 a.m. I'm not at 2,600. Um, so like the, because it's a modular group, you don't have the visibility. So that's really, if you really want to have like a very, very abstract view of, um, of these levels of this, these kinds of security is that um, because, the, because the operations wrap around, if I do an, expo if I do an exponentiation, which on, you know, these, this number is very big. It's 256-bit integers. And the, uh, the group generator here is like a, an elliptic curve point. But anyway, it becomes a really big number. So it's gonna, the exponentiation, as you're adding it, it's going to wrap around a lot of times. So you, so you can't divide. Because, because it's, the, once it wraps around once, you have no idea like, how, which, how to uh, undo the wrap. Um, so that's, so this is, you know, that's a discrete logarithm problem. And you know, like a lot of crypto is not really proven. But after like 30 years of the crypto, um, differential crypto analysis, we're pretty sure that it's fine. Um, if this discrete logarithm problem is broken, a lot of this stuff is broken. Um, so some of the properties of the group, like to put them concretely, like uh, the G here, the so you take a group, you, you take um, elliptic curve points, um, like this, you know, like x is 54, y is 243, and you multiply that by a scalar. Um, and that's like then you that's how you get the that a public key, um, you know private keys are scalars integers from the underlying field, um, so the field the field is again like a modular group. Um, so one fun property about um, RSA sorry uh, elliptic curves is that a 256 bit key, uh, elliptic curve key gives equivalent security to uh, the same of the same well it gives the same security as a 3072 two-bit RSA key. So the keys are much, much smaller, which is important as well for these kind of signatures because ring signatures are big. Um, they have a lot of like, um, you know, uh, side information that you have to generate. Um, and it's also kind of like uh, how, why, you know, if, you, if you're in the cryptocurrency space at all, how, why like Bitcoin and whatever have taken off. It's basically, what only was made possible because of elliptic curves. If you had to use RSA for this stuff, um, again, like the, there's like orders of magnitude more information you have to store because the signatures are just so much bigger. It's so much slower to generate RSA signatures and so on and so forth. Anyway, so here's a really cool property: is the homomorphism um, between the private key and the public key. So if the private key is x and the public key is g to the x. Then the private key of public key of the public key times um, k, like a random number k, to the x, is x times k. So, so this is actually used for stealth addresses in Bitcoin. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But basically, what this, what this means is that if I give you my public key, um, you, can t you can generate a random number. Um, you know, like you can, and that random number can, can sort of be seen as like a side private key. Uh, generate a public key from that side private key. Take the public key, my public key, and you, the public key you've just generated, like add them together, create a new public key, and send me, send me the, or the world, this doesn't even need to be secret, send me k, the side private key, and I have, the, and this gives me the private key to, the, to our combined key. Um, so it's, it's an interesting way to even do like anonymous, uh, well, like uncorrelatable signatures, because you can encrypt a message with a scheme. You can encrypt a message to me, um, 
in a way that only I know that you encrypted it to me, and nobody else knows because they do not, they cannot uh, reverse a discrete, discrete log on this. Um, so yeah, we, you know, this, these, if you abstract it in this way, just basically just see all operations you could do on integers, you know, discrete integers, like no, no floats or anything. All the operations you can do on integers, you can do a look at the curves, but division, you can't divide. That's, the, that's what the, like, you know, that's what makes the discrete logarithm problem hard. You have the brute force. Um, and, you know, for, to, for, all the people, for the people who, also, who sometimes worry, oh, you know, like the curves maybe not safe, there's like all that stuff about the NSA, blah, blah, blah. Um, not really, because, you know, the 200, for a 256-bit field, counting from one to two to 256, just counting, not even generating signatures or, or trying to generate keys, takes more than the lifetime of the universe, even if you have a, like a sun-sized computer that's like theoretical max efficiency. Oh, and even with quantum computers, um, if you use this right, it still doesn't really break it. Um, quantum computers are like some magic pill. Um, you need to have a quantum computer that's at least 256 qubits to break 256 EC keys, but that doesn't immediately break it. It doesn't give you some magical oracle that just like, you know, immediately takes out, uh, gives you a private key from a public key. Um, it just, it squares, it's, it takes the square root of the difficulty. So 256 bit keys give you 128 bit security. Uh, if you have a quantum computer of 256, 256 qubits, you have 64 bit uh, security, uh, information theoretical security. But that's still not easy. Like, to, to break a 64 bit key would still take many, many, many years of computational time. So even if the government has like very, very powerful quantum kind of computers, they would only be able to use them on select keys. They can't just like, you know, swipe or, or, or sweep over the entire set of all keys that are used and, and, and like pretend that they're going to get anything. So quantum computing is not the magic pill everybody talks about. Anyway, so let's take a concrete example, and here's when we start going into some math. Um, but I, I'll, I'll explain this thoroughly. So as a concrete example, let's take Schnorr signatures. So this is not actually what's commonly used. Um, commonly, you maybe hear the term ECDSA, that's a signature. So Schnorr was patented. So people haven't used it until recently because the patent just expired. Schnorr is amazing. It's like the most intuitive way and simplest and implemented way to do signatures on like the curves. Because it was patented, somebody, came up, somebody had to come up with ECDSA, ECDSA, which is like trying not to do what Schnorr does. And it's really fucked up because of that. Um, it's a horrible algorithm, but Schnorr is what we should all have been using if patents weren't like fucking up the world every day. Um, so, you know, they provide zero knowledge proof of knowledge of the exponent, right? So I'm proving to you that I have, that I know um, x in g to dx without giving you anything else about it. There's a special property here that you, if you pay attention, you, you can clock onto, which is very interesting, right? So this means the signature reveals nothing at all about the private key. It does not provide an attack or any information for brute force. So even if I had unbounded computation, if I was like a, if I wasn't a polynomial time bounded attacker, brute forcing the entire state still does not tell me which key you use. Like, there's no way to be 100% sure. It's like they're indistinguishable. Um, so here's the math. So this is like simulation game in cryptography. Um, normally, you replace it with hashes, and that's how you do signatures. But, um, you know, like, walking through this is real quick. So generator, so gen by the way, generator is, like, always public. Uh, just like the generator in Diffie-Hellman or RSA, the generator is, like, the generator is, like, two. Here, the generator is just some big number. But it's a public number. Everybody knows that. So we take... Um, we take uh, the generator and, and raise it to W, which is like a random number. So, um, and then we get like a big W, which is kind of like a pseudo public key. Um, so Alice, I'm Bob, and I have my private key, and I just generated my, my W. This, this, both these numbers, X and W, are like secret. I, I never really reveal them to anybody. So Alice have my, has my public key, which is you know, just G to the X. So, you know, like, which is the public key of my, to my private key. So she already has this before we start the simulation game. Um, and at, when we start this, before we start the simulation game, I already have X, and I just pick a random Y out of the blue. Um, so I send, a dub, I send uh, Alice this pseudo public key. So now that this is called the commitment phase, and now that Alice has sent me, now that Alice has the W, she says she's, she, uh, she's gonna like try to generate a challenge that must verify given W, right? So I've committed to W, I can't take it back. Um, so she, she picks a random, uh, a random number, again, just C, and, um, and sends it to Bob, me. Now I take, uh, I do this little operation here, which I take W, my pseudo-private pseudo number, well, pseudo-private key number, 
and I subtract c times x to it, and so and that's r. And then I send r the response to Alice, and then Alice checks, oh, does g to the r times Bob's public key uh, times the challenge that I gave him equal w. Uh, so that's like the simulation game. And if you, if you like spend a little bit of time looking at the, uh, thinking about the math, um, you can see how the signature works. It's actually quite simple. If you just, you just pretend these are like, don't even pretend that we're doing anything on elliptic curves. These are just like normal numbers. You have um, g, uh, g to the r times public key, Bob's public key, times Alice's challenge. Um, is W, right, like the big commitment that I sent, that I sent Alice. And if you, uh, if you um, expand it, public, remember that uh, the public uh, key is just G to the X. Right? Um, yeah, the public key is just G to the X, right? So we, let's swap G uh, public key with G to the X, and then, you know, um, this just becomes G to the X C. And then uh, R, uh, the, the thing that we're raising, the thing that Alice is raising to check for the equivalence is, again, just... Uh, w minus Cx, and I've just rearranged it here to make it more simple. So W minus Xc, W minus Cx, and W minus Xc is, are the same thing. Um, uh, Cx and uh, Xc, yeah. So if we uh, like reduce, reduce this algebraically, these two things cancel out, you know, um, just, just because of laws of exponents. So G uh, to the W minus Xc times uh, G to the Xc cancels out. So we just have G to the W, which is again W, right? So only if I have an X can I cancel that out after I've already committed to W, right? If, only if I have the private key to my public key, because otherwise I wouldn't be able, I, I just don't have the number uh, available to cancel that out. And again, we can't do division, so we can't, we can't um, get this number out of nowhere. Um, so now there's an important property here that like, there's a reason we had to do the simulation game in order. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you just forget everything that I just told you, and you just like, look at this equation here, um, if I just take g, if I just take this uh, here, and I just pick a random r and a random c, know that, know that, remember that Alice never gets a little w or a little x. If I just pick a random r and a random c, a literally out of the blue, I can, create a, I can create a valid w, right? So this is, I can create a valid signature if Alice doesn't see me commit to w first. Because I can create a valid signature by just picking random values out of the air, if I don't have this commitment phase first, this signature provides no knowledge about the exponent other than, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the, yeah, it provides no knowledge about the exponent at all if I don't have the commit phase. Given the commit phase, Alice can force me to play the simulation game properly um, such that, you know, uh, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not cheating and I haven't picked out random numbers that, like, co you know, coalesce. So, you know, in normal, in normal, in normal functions, uh, in normal, yeah, in normal signatures, this is called an interactive zero-knowledge proof. So Schnorr is non-interactive zero knowledge proof. So the commitment is normally replaced by a hash function to force WC causality. So because I have to, because the hash, the hash function is, you know, I can't just pick a random C out of the air and then be like, oh, what input of the hash function gives me C, right? That's, that's the whole point of a hash function. You can't just pick a, you can't just have like an output hash and then like magically take the input that gives you out, that gives that out. So you have to pick W um, to compute GW before having C. So that's like, that sort of like uh, simulates the Alice's commitment. But yeah, just, just um, you know, really focus on this fact that if we don't follow this protocol in order, and if Alice doesn't see me commit to big W first, um, I can generate infinite signatures, right? So uh, after, if we use the interactive version of the protocol, or even the non-interactive one, these signatures are forgeable if you don't follow the protocol. But they are not forged, they're not, but they're still sound, as in like, you still have proof if you follow the protocol, correct. you have the proper proof if you follow the protocol correctly. Um, and uh, yeah, like, it, it, but you know, like, so they have, that, they have that security guarantee, but there is zero knowledge. Um, yeah, whoa. So, okay, so that's, that's, a, that's like, you know, it's really the simplest type of zero knowledge, it's zero knowledge proof of an exponent. So, you know, if we, You'll see some of the similarities. I mean, I'll, I'll share the slides um, later on, or you know, I'll share, them, I'll share them on Twitter. You can follow my Twitter or look at my Twitter. But uh, this is this is just remember this this equivalence relation here. So here's like the mask for the ring signatures. You know, I don't expect you to understand this, but I've uh, you know I've turned it into pseudocode later on. Um, so like if you can kind of tell, the ring signature is really just a, an extension of the original zero knowledge proof. So um, this this whole part here. Can be done by anybody, 
right? So we have the simulation game that can be done by anybody. The only part that requires you to have the real signature is this, because that's, that's the only part that um, you know, like really relies on um, CX. I mean, other than this, this is just a tag. We'll talk about that later. But um, you can see here, right, there's a zero knowledge proof where we, we multiply all of these uh, like uh, pseudo-public pseudo keys, pseudo, pseudo commitments together, and make it so that when hashing them, the sum of all the, the sum of all the uh, of all the commitments must equal uh, the hash of all the commitments. Um, so I mean, uh, yeah, it's a little bit uh, a little bit a little bit hard to follow. Um, again, you, you can like uh, read this later on, but this is the important part. You see, look, R minus C X, and this is is the same as here. Um, which is you know w minus cx here it's called the witness there it's called the uh, like the I don't know like the random commitment but that the zero knowledge proof that's in the ring signature is exactly the same as the zero knowledge proof that's in, in this normal signature except except for you um, you have you add it to all the other pseudo commitments in the keys um, so yeah I mean yeah I guess it's hard I guess it's hard to follow this stuff on, on a presentation but this is like if you don't if you can't understand like cryptography cryptography maths, this is a little bit easier to follow through in your own time. So if you spend a little time like doing, you know, drawing this by hand, oh, and just as for, so for some notation, if I do A to the N, I just mean concatenate all these. So take A1, A2, A3, and, you know, when I do H hash, this just means, you know, concatenate all these variables and, and, and return me the hash. Um, so, you know, you can see that this, that similarity there between uh, generating that zero knowledge proof and because I don't know, as a, as a third party after you've done this protocol, I don't know which one of the keys you used. Um, again, because, because these, the signature generated here by not having the key, and just the signature generated here by having the key are indistinguishable from each other, um, I only use like a little bit of a hash pre-commitment here to make sure that I, I do have to have one of the keys. But after I, after I provide you the commitment hash, um, well, the commitment scheme um, with the hash uh, protocol, I just have no idea which one of the keys you use to generate the real signature. Um, they all look indistinguishable to me. And again, remember the simulation game. If I just pick a random C and a random R, I get a, I do get a valid signature W. Um, if I if nobody if nobody forced me to commit the W first, and it's the same here. So um, you know, in in the where I don't have the keys, I just create bogus signatures. This is this is just a little bit of an extended way to to generate those bogus signatures. Um, but you can see that these are just random numbers modulo Q, and their commitment is just a random number, number modulo Q. So we'll, we'll like, stop with this for now. Um, you, you know, uh, so it's, it's not that hard to understand, but uh, you can review it later. So if you extend our, the ring signatures, uh, so we did sort of some math. We can make our ring signature scheme allow us to check if somebody has signed twice, but we still don't never know who exactly signed. And how we, we do this? Over here, this is tau, the tag. I take the hash of the ring and the message, and this, this is a special hash function that doesn't hash into a number. It hashes to an elliptic curve point. Uh, sorry, no, actually, this, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This hashes to an elliptic curve point. I take the curve point, and I power it by my private key, and that tag is always going to be the same for the same message in the ring, right? But again, it's irreversible because we have the same issue. I can't, I can't reverse the streak log. So that's, like, that's what that tag is. That's what the math. So, so if we follow this protocol and I, and I construct the hash this way for the commitment, yes, I can tell, yes, you signed twice, but I don't know exactly who signed um, twice. So no matter how many times you sign, I'll just take one of your signatures, but your security is still safe if you accidentally signed twice. So, so now this becomes more useful than leaking a secret. For a specific message, you know, like one, two, three, we can ascertain that one and only one member in the group signed that message um, for a specific signature. Uh, or you know, if you wanted to have like a, a voting protocol, uh, you can say, look, I have a, the message of ten keys, and uh, if I if I have a signature from one guy, from one signature here and another signature here, um, I can compute them. I can compute the tag, and if they're different, it's two different people who signed. I just I still don't know who signed though. Um, I just know two different people from the set have signed, and nobody du nobody double signed. So yeah, this allows us to use a scheme for anonymous voting, private transactions. And the topic of this talk, which is the anonymous credentials and rate limiting. Um, okay. So here's the simplest construction um, that where you could use the scheme. Say we have a ring of public keys R stored on a server that's behind an anonymized like port like Tor ITB. If you have ever ran hidden services, you know that like especially like if you're running a forum, one of the pain in the one of the huge pain in the ass is getting uh, like flooded because again like every single IP 
uh, every single user looks like they're coming from localhost, right? So you have no idea. I mean, unless you like start doing weirdly tricky things that like our shoes shouldn't really be doing, um, and people shouldn't be leaking if they're using an anonymous site where it's like, oh, let me look at the user agent and the latency and blah blah blah. But assuming that the assuming that the network is is proper and you want to like go through all this crap, you know, you, you just have these massive flood problems where like one one uh, user can totally uh, like make your forum or or your I don't know, your website unusable because they're just flooding it around them. That consistently, if you ban them, you ban everybody because they're indistinguishable from everybody else. So for each epoch, so epoch is like a, like a segment of time, so every, so every 10 minutes or any 10 minute stretch, our server provides a random mes message M. So for, you know, from 1 to 1.10 PM, the message M is like ABC. From uh, 1.10 to 1.20 PM, the message is XYZ, right, whatever. Uh, so they, it provides a message that participants must sign in order to, to submit a portion of a server. So they take the message, they put, they sign it, and then they like, uh, you know, they they attach their post like, you know, like alongside it. So he's like, look, this post has is is allowed to, this poster is allowed to submit because they uh, they can generate a signature for this epoch. So this in essence limits each participant in an anonymous manner to posting a message every 10 minutes, um, while each participant. Is completely anonymous on a network on the network, and crypt and and ugh. so while each participant is completely anonymous on a cryptography and networking level, for any one message M, they can only sign once. Is double signs are detected. Um, so you know the important limitation here is is as following: the signature is specific for the message R uh, ring computa computation. Like uh, as we saw. Uh, as we saw early, earlier, it's like this is this is this is how the tag is generated. So if either the message or the ring changes, as in like if I add a participant into the ring, um, like you can now all of it, now you can uh, double spend again. Now you can double sign again um, because yeah, the, like this indistinguish now becomes indistinguishable from from the other ring. Um, so there's there's an issue here which has some privacy implications, right? But let's walk, let's just walk through like. It really quick, so the server has like a pre-populated list of public keys. Um, you know, people we like this is this could be like a guy that has invited someone. You you have like a, a round where people can just request a key, and then after the day is done, you, when you have your, you have this key, then you can use the keys late, the day after, whatever, whatever. So anyway, in whatever way we do this, we have the um, the, the, the the set of public keys um, that the server has are so that's fixed. This is not going to change, and the user has one key from here. So the user generates a signature, you know, um, sigma, sigma one over, and by the way, these, there's like random components in these signatures. So every time I generate a signature, it's gonna be different, except for one particular piece, which is a tag. For, and the tag is always gonna be the same if uh, R and M are the same. So, you know, it sends the server with an action, like, look, I, I wanna post this post like hello world to the server. The server's like, great, I see, I see that given sigma, you do have a key on this ring, I just don't know which one. The server applies with success, computes unique tag from signature and stores that tag into the database. So like, you know, this tag can never be used again. Um, so the, if this user now generates another signature, every single, every single parameter of this signature is completely different, except for one parameter, which is a tag, which can be, uh, like, which you can compute to be the same. Um, because they remember, they've just signed over RM1, RM1, it's the same. The server detects the tag and the signature the same and rejects. So this, the, the, the user is still completely anonymous. They're just prevented from, from signing more than once per epoch, right? So, so it's just in, in essence, they're prevented from submitting more than once every 10 minutes. So to, to get around the, limit, the limitation that we described here, um, where well, we can never change the ring once we set this up, um, the simplest scheme would be to only allow additions to the rings once per day, right? So this is like the naive way of constructing this. So to prevent spammers from accruing lots of keys to spam with, or maybe, I just, maybe I'll just like, you know, I'll request like 10,000 keys, and then I'll just, uh, then I have 10,000, I can do 10,000 posts every 10 minutes, right? That, that doesn't, we haven't solved anything there. So additions to the ring can be governed by the same protocols, so each participant that currently holds a key is allowed to anonymously invite one participant per day by submitting their signed public key to the server, so I, I, I take my private key and I sign a signature, and I sign like the message, and then I, I append that message to a public key that I want added to the ring, and then you know every day the ring is rotated. So, but I don't like this though because there's like some there's some privacy problems that remain here. Um, so of course, if today, so this is like when we get into like why anonymity is really hard, you have to really think about this stuff. If today I have ring R and it has n keys, like 100 keys, and tomorrow I have the same ring, 
and one extra key, so 101 keys, the new key or the new user can only have made posts from that day onwards, right? There's no way that that guy, that key that was just added, like made a key, made a post yesterday because that key wasn't in there yet yesterday. So we leaked some information about participation. So a new user, you know, like this key was added today. So any posts from today are only 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 posts from today onwards can be attributed to this key probabilistically. Posts from yesterday cannot be attributed to this key, right? So you have some leak side channel leaks there. And if we never remove keys. The older keys, the oldest keys that are, in, that are in the ring, will be the most represented in the posting history due to the having had more chances and, and more time and more chances to post, opening up some statistical analysis attacks. Like, you know, uh, the people who have been in, in there the longest are like the, the ones with the most posts, everything else equal. Um, and, you know, furthermore, the invite systems for skis isn't really a perfect fit for honest networks. We can do better. Um, it doesn't really make sense. Like, you know, imagine if Tor or I2P were invite only, like you couldn't spin up a node if you weren't invited. Like it doesn't, it's not really condu like conducive to these kinds of communities. So what can we do? So it turns out we can actually reduce the privacy issues to the best case, the best anonymity that the underlying P2P network provides. So I'll choose I2P here because of its actor routing model. Unlike in Tor, each I2P router must also relay traffic. Since I2P is darknet only, you're only ever really relaying encrypted traffic to another I2P node. So it's not like Tor, where if I force you to be an exit node, then you get like the government knocking on your door two days later because somebody's like, you know, uh, hacked the DNC or whatever um, through your Tor node. Um, so I2P is darknet only. It's like uh, if you ever use hidden services on Tor, uh, like those are uh, completely end-to-end -end encrypted and they use a really network internally. And um, so like whenever I, whenever I, if I'm a, if I'm a relay, so there's three different types of relays in Tor. There's like uh, you know, like middle, middle nodes, guard nodes, and exit nodes. If I'm like a middle node on Tor, uh, uh, like all the traffic that I ever relay is encrypted. So I2P is like Tor, but only darknet mode. You can only, um, you can only uh, ever like look at the internal hidden service sites. Um, but also, uh, it's, there's like a special property that allows us to use the scheme in, in the multimal approach, which is you cannot, you just cannot participate in the, in the I2P network unless you're also relaying other people's traffic. Um, that's how they keep that, their indistinguishability. So I2P nodes have already, already have public node keys associated that they advertise when active on the network. So you know, like, I got, you know, an I2P node is called an I2P router because it routes other people's packets. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, like uh, when, I, when I joined the network, I'm, I broadcast the network, look, hey, I am node X with public key whatever. Please you know, send. Use me as a relay if you want. And so you can, like, you have to have bandwidth symmetry in, in I2P. So if I want to send, if I want to send a request, a request um, to a server to get their packets, I have to wait, I kind of have to wait, like, for a similar request to come in so I can bundle it. Uh, obviously not, like, not 100% like that because otherwise nobody would ever be able to send anything at all. But, like, you have to, you have to keep this kind of, um, like, a, like, equal symmetry. You can only, like, shoot out what you, what you take in. So because, you, because of this protocol rule, um, any packet you send out is indistinguishable from a packet that you're also relaying, right? So the nodes use these keys to form unidirectional multi-hop tunnels. Just like in Tor, there's like multiple hops. But unlike Tor, they're not bidirectional. So my request uh, outwards can take a different, completely different tunnel than my, my reply, right? So which is also gives you like better anonymity. So, um, so they have, and also it's got bundle encryption similar, similar to Tor, like, uh, you know, maybe I send, I send to like this node here, and then that node decrypts, and then that node knows where to send, and so on. It might actually, it might, like as you see here, it might actually loop back to me, uh, you know, from, from uh, I, you know, PK1 to PK4 to PK3, and actually loops back to me, and now PK2. So I have no idea, so to a passive reserve, you have no idea whether you've just relayed a packet or you just use your own packet. Um, or, you know, like issue your own packet. So to send a retrieve traffic at all, you must be publicly reachable on the network through one of these keys. So I2P router keys, unfortunately, they use Algamol keys at the moment. It's not, not the same properties that live the curves. It's technically possible to do this with Algamol. There's only one paper on it. It's behind a paywall. Uh, there's no security analysis on it, I'm, so I'm not going to use it. But, you know, we'll just assume this. And, uh, you know, and that's not, there's not going to be a demo for an I2P scale scheme unless I like roll on my own I2P or I convince the I2P devs to include AC node keys. Um, yeah, we'll see because there's like two guys that work on I2P and they don't have a lot of resources. But uh, so the I2P router database, it's similar to Tor. I2P has a list of nodes, uh, but unlike Tor, it's a distributed hash table. Um, 
So there's a fun fact. Tor is actually centralized. There is a centralized point in Tor. It has 8 to 12 central directory servers that keep the list of guard nodes, relay nodes, and uh, relay and exit points. If those servers go down, stops, stops, Tor stops working unless you know how to hard code relay addresses manually when bootstrapping. It is you know, a little fun fact that few people know about. Um, so when hosting a hidden service on, uh, an, or an EEP site on I2P, you can know when the node key of any router is interacting with your service. Um, yeah, you can know the node key of any router is interacting with your service, your, your you know, hidden website, because they've encrypted a packet to your EP side address, which is just the node key, right? So maybe you can notice here how big that scroll bar is. Uh, I2P, I2P addresses are not hashed like, like Tor addresses. They're just, this is just the entire public key, and that's how nodes find each other by public key uh, fingerprinting. You know, that's a very big key. This could be, because it uses Algamal, right? It, if it was like elliptic curves, it'd be a lot smaller, whatever, anyway. Um, so, like, how can we extend our ring signature to, uh, to the additional security that, uh, like, the underlying network provides? So, our ring R can simply be the set of node keys we currently see live on the network. So, it's the whole, and now it's the whole active network that can, that can reach the ring authentication server. It leaks no additional information because, obviously, node keys that aren't live on the network can't communicate with the EEP site anyway. If you were scanning the network and keeping track of it, you would get no, no, you would get no less and no more information. You get exactly this, we leak exactly the same amount of information as the underlying peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, plus, by real time, like with, you know, with real time, I mean, we epoch regulator to like, you know, update the ring every 30 minutes. If we remove the keys as the IP, as, it, as the I2P routers disappear and are no longer reachable, we stop long-term correlation attacks. So for today, the ring is completely different from tomorrow because the nodes today are completely different from the nodes tomorrow. All, yeah, also because I2P routers like route, um, cycle their keys after a while. So finally, because now acquiring a key necessitates building deep circuits into the network, it also solves civil attacks because each key requires a certain amount of bandwidth to maintain. So like if you don't, are not aware of the civil problem, uh, it's like from the, the terms from a movie, but basically it means I can look, let me, let me appear to be the majority of the network by just spinning up a lot of nodes, generating a lot of keys, making a lot of accounts. If there's zero cost to creating a new identity, then there's zero cost to DDoSing the network, right? Because, you know, but actually we, we're, we solved the civil attack because uh, maintaining a well-connected I2P router is not zero cost. It requires like a certain amount of bandwidth, like 200 kilobit, kilobit up and down. It requires long-term commitment to the network, a lot of relays, and like all the nodes kind of like have reputation with each other, just like in Tor. So if your node like you know is a real dick and like drops packets all the time, you're just gonna get blacklisted from, net, from the network. Um, so you know, making 100 identities basically is basically equivalent to owning 100 connection lines. So we solve the symbol problem. So. With the construction integrated in the network, peer identity, we've been able to devise a scheme where uh, we don't suffer any loss of privacy whatsoever. Your, uh, your users can be rate limited if you wish, but beyond that, nothing else happens to the privacy. We have the same privacy as like a totally anonymous I2P or Tor. Um, we gain anti-spam capabilities. Authentication is not only anonymous, but permissionless. You don't need to be invited into this ring. The ring is just constructed based on the, based on the node keys. And we gave the key identities a cost which is the cost of being an active relay. So yeah, cryptography is great and magical. Like it, you know, it, it, it can do so many amazing things if you it just just if you know if you really understand a few properties about the the underlying cryptographic primitives. Um, cool. So that's that's about 45 minute mark. Any questions?